Hey guys, it's Edward. So today, I wanted to do a deeper exploration into how I learn from my mistakes when studying for the coding interview and formulate my entire process into an actual video. Consider this a follow-up to my first video of how I study basic data structures, patterns, and algorithms. In that video, I made some mistakes in my solution and my coding and my design. And I kind of gloss over the whole process that I use to self-evaluate and really learn from my mistakes. It's one thing to say, hey, I made a mistake. I should just avoid it. It's another thing to really identify why you made those mistakes and how you can properly avoid it in the context of your approach. And that's exactly what I'm going to do in today's video. I'm going to show you the questions I ask myself, the process I go through, and the steps I take to improve my own problem solving strategy. I will assume that you have mastered the basics of studying your patterns and data structures and algorithms. I shouldn't have to ask you to study uh, what a DFS is or what dynamic programming is. You should be able to look that up yourself and be able to study it. The real thing we're going to deal with today is being able to implement that and learn from our incorrect implementations. So if you haven't seen that video on studying basic structures and algorithms and that whole process, I'll link it here. This is going to be important because this video focuses on how I improve at problems that go beyond the basics. It's a general approach on how I learn from my own mistakes, especially for more advanced problems. There's no point in studying your own mistakes if your primary problem is a knowledge problem like you don't know how to do recursion. By the end of the video, you'll be able to process your mistakes for yourself. You'll begin the process of self-evaluating and critiquing your own mistakes. But if you still need help after this, hit me up at eachandtech.com for some coaching. So welcome to the coding interview. You suck. But first things first, let's do some housekeeping. Let's talk a little bit about the philosophy of problem solving. This sounds really boring, but trust me, this is really important because it will help you focus on the right things when evaluating your own mistakes. Let's first address the big, big elephant in the room, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, throughout the series, I've consistently said that the Dunning-Kruger effect is what prevents people from actually improving. After all, how can we improve ourselves if it exists? That is, how can we improve our own results if we're not competent at all at seeing or identifying those mistakes? If we were competent enough to identify those mistakes, whether it was writing bad code or doing bad planning, we wouldn't actually be making these mistakes to begin with, right? Well, this is where we can actually address this to some degree. This is where a good source of knowledge can adequately walk us through the solution. We will assume that that source of knowledge is absolutely correct and our goal is to see the results and get as close as possible as we can to it. That is the thought process that it goes through, how fast it is, and we just want to be able to try and copy that. We want to clone ourselves in order to do the optimal approach. And so this is where having a good source of knowledge that shows you all this is absolutely critical. But in our case, what we're really trying to do here is reverse engineer that thinking. It's not so much that it's important that we get the answer. It's really the thought process that goes behind getting the answer. And most importantly, that we actually are consistent every single time we do this. And so we need to improve our systematic thinking in order to get closer to the answer. And so we assume that the solution that does this does it for us in a systematic way. We can adopt different ideas, strategies, and questions into our thinking in order to improve our approach. But we need to master one at a time. So that is why I say we need to have a singular source of knowledge. This also means we don't want to blame execution or the final step. It's absolutely meaningless to say I should be more careful because it's vague and it doesn't target a specific area for action. My belief is that mistakes come from being put in a bad situation. If you say something like, I should be more careful when writing or I could have executed better, that's really not helpful. How careful is careful? Should I retest everything over and over and over again? Why would I do the exact same thing over and over again? I'm just gonna get the same result. And so there are many, many factors that lead up to a mistake. We want to eliminate those factors with good habits that apply across the board. Randomly doing things just to avoid one mistake or a corner situation can lead to a lot of issues. After all, you throw the baby out with the bathwater. You trade out all the good stuff you're doing just to hedge against that one bad position or that one bad mistake. Because remember, good preparation makes avoiding mistakes easier. And so we want to optimize this preparation, the planning of the code, the design, the understanding, the testing, the code coverage, all these areas should be scrutinized and thought about, whether that is being too slow or missing out on some critical thought. So keep this in mind as you watch this video. But enough chit chat. 
let's actually talk about the process of learning from your mistakes. Firstly, in order to address the Dunning-Kruger issue, I'm going to recommend Elements of Programming Interview as your source of knowledge. EPI does a very good job at laying out the step-by-step -step explanation for how to actually solve the problem and how they go from a naive solution to the optimal one. And this is especially important because we're going to be comparing ourselves to the optimal solution. And again, you want to focus on one chapter or topic at a time. And the reason why I emphasize EPI is because it follows the same mantra that very rarely do you actually come up with an optimal solution right off the bat. Most of the time, there are iterations upon iterations of suboptimal solutions that will lead you to a final solution. And each step, each iteration is logical. And EPI does a very good job at expressing what the difference is in between each step and the insight you need. Next, you need to be able to time and record yourself. Get a timer and an audio recorder. You don't necessarily have to be on a Google Doc to do all your work. You, pencil and paper will do just fine. For me though, what I usually do is I have OBS running similar to what I have on my stream where I have my microphone and my timer set up. And so you can actually download OBS for free. I'll link it below in the description. However, when doing the problem, you do need to speak your thoughts, similar to how you might actually conduct yourself in an actual interview. But most of your thoughts and actions should actually be on paper. If you didn't write it, it doesn't exist. Plus having these on paper actually helps when going back over the problem. You know, you might actually end up misremembering what you said or thought. Plus speaking your thoughts aloud is very helpful. If you watch my coaching videos, you'll notice that I preach talking about the problem and running through examples verbally. This helps the interviewer understand what you're thinking and it helps you walk through your own thinking instead of just, you know, doing things randomly in your head. And doing things randomly in your head often leads to a lot of misunderstandings and mistakes. Third, and this is really important, you need to actually try and do the problem. Seriously, a lot of people just try to actually only look at the solution. Don't do this. Actually take an earnest attempt at trying to solve the problem with your systematic approach. And finally, once you've had a good run at the problem, then we can actually begin the actual evaluation. So at this point, you have your attempt at a solution, the record of how much time you took, and then the audio from that attempt. So with that, we're actually ready to begin. What you need to do now is really dissect every decision that you make, every thought that you've had when solving the problem. And this comes in the form of a bunch of questions that you need to ask yourself. This is a list of questions that you should ask yourself at minimum. At least these are the questions that I do. So first, let's compare the difference between the optimal solution and your solution. Walk through how you got to your own solution or your attempt at one and compare it to the steps the optimal solution took. Because we emphasize a good source of information, we assume that the optimal solution in the book is the best one in the universe for this particular problem. And we want to try and get as close to the optimal solution and execution as possible. So because of that, every little decision that you made that was not in line with what the solution had is going to need to be scrutinized. It's all about emulating the steps and trying to figure out why they took the steps that they did and how you could have avoided making some mistakes of your own or any of the suboptimal steps. What were the steps that the optimal solution took? Did I try to explore those? If I missed an idea that the optimal solution had or a step that it took, what would it take for me to recognize that as the next step? On top of that, when looking at your own solution, you should be asking, were there thoughts and paths that you took that didn't lead anywhere? How can you avoid these? What did you need to do in order to see this first? And how could you have a better intuition into that insight? Or if you didn't get the solution at all, what were the insights you needed in order to get started? Is it logical and simple that anyone can figure it out if they just got stuck? And as a big point here, very rarely is an optimal solution born out of thin air. Usually there's a logical series of steps that can be built on top of each other in order to get the optimal solution. So you should try to look for places where you try to do some weird Hail Marys, where you tried to throw some random stuff at the problem and hopefully a solution fell out. Did I try to YOLO the code? Did I try to do some weird magic bullets? Could I avoid this? Is there a logical train of thought that can prevent me from doing all these weird, unnecessary, and random attempts? Once you have that down, the next thing to do is to look at your own replay. I highly recommend watching this at about 1.25 to 1.5 speed and you know, recording the timestamp at which you express certain thoughts. Now, if you look at your timestamps, you should look at where you spend a lot of time at and really ask yourself, 
What did I spend too much time on? How can I avoid wasting this extra effort and time? Was there extra thoughts that did nothing? Did I overemphasize one step over another? Did I not spend enough time on another step? Could I add more time to a different area in order to prevent some mistakes that I made later? Should I invest more time into this area to ensure that I am at lower risk of mistakes later on in this step? This part is tricky because too many times people have a habit of cutting corners. So for this part, you should actually ask yourself how to improve your time without sacrificing the quality of your design and planning, you know, to not assume too much risk when problem solving. But it's about seeing how much time that you can reallocate from one area to another to ensure that there is less risk, less chances of mistakes, and other areas. If you invest more time into design, you will have less risk of writing buggy code, but there's also a point of diminishing returns. If you cut too much in the design though, it can come at the expense of your own code, becoming sloppy and buggy. So this practice does require a little bit of finesse and a process. And so finally, after all that, we've come to the third part, the code itself. Because we follow the philosophy that good design leads to good code, there is always critiquing the steps that lead up to the code itself. Once we clear all this, once we clear the preconditions, then we can actually examine our code implementation itself. The questions that we wanna ask ourselves are, why did I write this bad line of code? Why was the comparison operator wrong? Could I have planned this better? What were the decisions that led up to this bad code or bad line? Could I have made a better decision earlier up the chain? What edge cases do I need to look out for? Could I have tested for this? Was this obvious earlier on in the problem when I was trying to do it? If there are too many edge cases, can I simplify my design and approach to be more systematic so I don't have to worry about remembering so many edge cases? So you see me do this in my own video on how I study, and I'll post it here. I state how I was making some execution mistakes in my design or that I wrote things a little too sloppily that confused me and led me to some bad code or mistaken code. And it's because I ask myself why I made those mistakes that I did. I conclude that I simply could have avoided these mistakes by organizing my own work a little bit better and avoiding using global variables. Now across all these three areas, notice that I don't ever blame the execution itself. I always blame the steps leading up to the execution, how I could prevent that mistake from actually happening. So instead of saying something vague like I should be more careful, we should make these actionable during our planning. So for instance, if I organize my space a little bit cleaner, I can avoid writing an incorrect comparison operator. If I do a test by cases, my conditional statements will be cleaner and easier to manage and they are independent of one another. There is none of these test cases that overlap one another. If I try to draw a logical line of thinking from start to solution, I don't have to try to magically YOLO my code. If I am doing iteration, I should be aware of the boundary condition. Each of these thoughts are based on avoiding the mistake to begin with. And if you have enough factors in your favor, the execution and decisions will become so much easier. So I try to answer the questions that I have listed in this manner. Make every answer actionable and target a part of the planning. Ask why things are the way they are and what series of actions led to the mistake and attack the easiest and most obvious actions that you can do. And most importantly, write all this down. Seriously, like keep a practice diary. Recording your mistakes in a practice diary with the amount of time that you took to solve the problem and the lessons you learned from them. This will be helpful to you in the future because once you see your past mistakes, it will help you avoid future ones. I'll link a sample one down below. That said, the final point I want to drive here is that it takes a lot of time to do this, and I mean a lot. You can easily spend one hour on a problem with the self-evaluation, the self-critique, and solving. It's a far cry from the 20 minutes that you might be used to spending on just doing a problem, giving up, and then looking at a solution, and then, you know, moving on. But I really encourage you to try and spend the time to do so. These lessons and feedbacks really add up. You might learn some wrong ideas or lessons and might need to correct it, but eventually you'll find yourself executing almost flawlessly because you'll have learned so many lessons along the way. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Also, feel free to follow me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. And if you want to try to secure the next job offer, you can book me for interview coaching at eChantech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you all in the next one.